Hi, Clarissa Mosley from Calm Mind Psychology, back again with the continuation of my series on depression. So in this episode, we're going to focus on the emotional and psychological symptoms and look at some of the potential risk factors for developing these emotional symptoms or some of the causes. Now, the causes are actually more like contributing factors. We cannot say what causes depression, and it's highly likely that it's not just one thing. And from all of the things that I'm going to talk about, you'll understand a little bit better how many different factors can actually pile on top of each other to create the straw that broke the camel's back and tripped someone into depression. So let's look at some of the largest risk factors for developing depression. Let's move on to some of the research that was conducted by Michael Yapko. And I hope I've pronounced that right. I'll hopefully put a link in the um, in the comments because he's actually written a couple of really good books on depression. But if we're looking at the number one risk factor for developing depression in child, adolescence or adulthood, it is having a mother or a parent or a primary caregiver, that is anyone who's place, in place of the mother that takes care of you as a child, who also suffers depression. How this happens when the baby is a very little infant and the mother or the primary caregiver is suffering from depression and the mother postnatal depression is that the baby is primed to be facilitated in their wiring up. Like, so the mother will be looking at the baby. This is wiring up the baby's brain. Our, the way that we look at them, the way we coo, the way we mirror them, the way we try and intuit what's going on inside that baby um, and, and mirror it back. This is in the form of play, in the form of caregiving, when we're, we're feeding them, changing them. So many interactions are providing the foundation for the baby's brain. Now, I, I, I demonstrated this in the previous video when I talked about postnatal depression. When the baby is looking at a mother's face and the mother's face is depressed, the mother is less likely to be able to respond. It's not that she doesn't want to. Severe depression is disabling in the sense of your social interactions and your mood and your ability to actually feel into the mind or emotions of another. Your brain is almost it's almost it's certainly almost shrunken once you've had a baby, but it, it's it's shrunken, it's compromised. There are parts of the brain that govern emotional regulation and emotional expression that simply aren't working. So it's not the mother's intention to be looking back at the baby with this flat, depressed, morose face or these slowed movements. It's not her intention, but however, what the baby is receiving is not what it needs to develop the foundational scaffolds for its neurological development. So the wiring can get disrupted at this very early age, unfortunately. Then everything that gets built upon that can also be a little bit compromised. Now, I have to make a, a side note here on the beauty of the neuroplastic brain and if this was the case when maybe when the baby was very small and then the mother recovers or another caregiver takes over or there are other people around that are taking care of the baby it can be sufficient enough for the child to develop um, adequately and wire up properly and there's always windows later on with the neuroplastic neural plastic brain of, of which a child definitely has. I mean, they are very malleable and um, able to change far more than adults are. So there's always opportunities to remediate this. But let's just focus in on what's happening in this baby when it's being raised by a mother with severe postnatal or clinical depression, is that the baby isn't getting the um, hormones, the endogenous opioids that are that get activated. So there's dopamine and the endogenous opioids that are in our own brain that we have enlivened 
in the joyous exchange and the excitable exchange that occurs between mother and baby at playtime. So let's say the baby could be three months old, it could be quite little, you know, once the baby can focus and, and, and respond and see and they're having playtime on the change mat and the mother's leaning over, you know, doing all these things and the baby's like, ah. So that's wiring up that endogenous opiate system, that dopamine system that wires up us for joy and excitement, right? Now, note that depressive people, depressed people, people with depression, do not experience joy. That is that primary up the top of the symptoms of depression, inability to experience joy. So it's really relevant to note the correlation between that feeling in later life and possibly the absence of this feeling in earlier life. So the other things that can happen, and I'm not finished with mothers unfortunately, but this applies equally to all family members, is when the child gets older and one of their primary caregivers, mother or father, are also depressed, Maybe the, the parent doesn't have a depressive episode until later in life for, sorry, later in the child's life for whatever reason. There are so many different things that can lead to depression as we're trying to establish. Then the child, and maybe this didn't happen when the, when the baby, when the child was a baby. So babyhood was fine, everything's wired up everything's good to go but then there's this long depressive episode of the mother with the child maybe it doesn't emerge until let's say the kid's five and dad's left he's, he's left her with the kids with no money it's been abusive he's run off with someone else mum's depressed right she she has every right to be depressed from being abandoned and run out on but her her depression is going to translate to the child or the children. It will show up in ways where, you know, the kid's five years old. Why? Why? Why did this happen? But why did that happen? But why is it blue? But why can't it be white? But why? So that ongoing curious questioning from the child isn't going to be responded to because the mother is going to be checked out to a degree. If anything, she might get irritated by the child's constant questioning because she doesn't have the space within her to be able to accommodate the child's demand. It can also be um, taught in a kind of attributional style in a, con in a cognitive mindset way. It's like if the parent's depressed, then their responses their ways of being, their reactions, and their way of speaking is going to echo that depression. So a child will learn these behaviors. There is a gloomy way of looking at the world. We don't go out much or have much fun. That's just the way things are. Life's hard and bad, and even if you do get on top of things, someone will come away and knock you down again. All of these beliefs and um ways of being in the world get translated to the child through learning. And so this is how parental depression can create a three to six times, three to six times greater incidence of depression in a person who has had a primary caregiver, parent, mother or father who have suffered depression while that person was a child. So Michael Yapko talks a lot about how depression is contagious and what he's referring to is the basic social structure that we exist in is not supportive of all of the things that mitigate against depression, social connection, activity, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose in one's own life. A lot of these things are absent in this modern day of technology. And the phone is one of the biggest killers, paradoxically, of connection, of feeling good about yourself, of feeling included and belonging, because you certainly don't look like that person who's overseas having a fabulous time and in beautiful outfits with their wonderful partner. That creates higher feelings of dissatisfaction with one's own life within someone. 
you're looking at pictures of perfection that are usually highly photoshopped or now with these amazing filters and your mind can't help but believe what it sees but there are so many different social factors that are present today that do not um, foster happiness and inclusion but certainly contribute towards depression and dysfunctional relationships are top of that list so we've talked about having a parent with depression you could have a grandparent you could have a friend you could have a brother or a sister you could have an environment which is harsh and hostile your parents may not have been overtly depressed but they could have been more of that sort of high functioning depression depression they went to work they came back they they had a drink they started drinking then they got in an argument Alternately, they were the low conflict but hostile and cold family environment. So all of these factors do not support the child in growing up to be someone who's healthy, happy, feels loved, cared for, the world is safe, life is good. Right? They create a mindset and a cognitive bias, which we're going to talk about next as being one of the other large contributing factors into depression that can lead to depression. So another factor that is very highly predictive of depression is victimization. And this again is from the research that Michael Yapko talks about, and it's two pronged victimization. So it's definitely a possibility with somebody who's suffered trauma in their past, who has been a victim of violence or abuse, who has been victimized, will have this sense of victimization with them. Particularly, we're looking at, let's look at bullying. Let's look at bullying where a person is identified as a victim target of the bully. Now, automatically you're gonna think about school and next workplace. But a lot of people live with their bullies. I've counseled many people that have been viciously bullied by a sibling. And you know, this is in your own home, the one place that you want to feel safe. If you cannot walk down the hall without your brother violently attacking you, what? where does that leave you? Where is your safe space? It may not be a sibling, but that is a very underestimated source of stress and conflict and bullying within, um, within people that we don't quite appreciate. Then there is the direct abuse by a parent, but there's also bully parents. A parent with narcissistic personality disorder can be incredibly bossy, demanding and bullying. They can put the kid down a lot and think it's funny. You know, that's bully behavior. It could be the parent that is authoritative to the nth degree and demands constantly from the child. Why haven't you done this? Where are your books? Why aren't they there? And it's nonstop and there's no good stuff in between. So I'm not knocking parents, you know, getting their kids in line, but there's also a, a balance that needs to occur. So if you're going to be bossy, then hopefully that's balanced that's a tiny little part of you and then the rest of your parenting is kind loving fun caring right but if it's only bossy then it's like having a bully as a parent all they're doing is telling you what you haven't done why why it's wrong what you did wrong how wrong you are what a failure you are and it's just bully behavior people can be in relationship with a bully an abusive partner is a bully. A highly narcissistic partner who is so absorbed in their own stuff and demands that the other person meet their needs and their needs only and does it and can do it in a very, um, not necessarily a violent, but an aggressive way. Why haven't you done this yet? You know, what's the deal here? The person in relationship with that kind of a person is being bullied. They are in a relationship with a bully. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be narcissism. It could be any other mental disorder. It could be someone with alcoholism. It could be someone with drug abuse problems. It could be someone who's just highly selfish and mean. So we can be the victim of bullying and, and become victimized through many different channels. And this victimization 
it becomes a mindset. So the person who has, and I'm going to use the word victim mentality, even though I don't like that so much because we've just talked about all the ways someone can have been victimized. Not always. I mean, you can have a victim mentality in the absence of anyone, you know, so much as it's doing anything bad to you, you can sometimes have that because the depressive mindset is very self-absorbed. It's very turned inward with you. When you're depressed, you are collapsed inwards. You are shrunken and isolated. And it cannot be anything other than all about you because you don't have the space to go beyond that. To reiterate, if you have been in an abusive, bullying relationship of any kind, or if you've been bullied relentlessly at school or in your workplace, you can develop the sense of learned helplessness. We discovered, psychologists discovered learned helplessness when we started doing experiments back in the old days when you can do all sorts of things to anyone and anything without any, any kind of moral compass around it. And what they did was they put dogs on an electrocuted plate and put electric shocks through the plate every now and then. So the dogs couldn't predict them <clears throat> and they couldn't escape them. Um, and they were obviously in a locked cage. But what they found is when they did this enough times for the dog and then they opened the door and they kept doing the shocks, did the dog run out the door? Mm -mm. The dog had learned that it could not escape its situation. It had learned to be helpless. It had learned to be a victim of these electric shocks. And the same thing can happen to people. And so they learn how to be helpless and hopeless through the process of this bullying or victimization and they become victimized they become victims so they're hopeless they feel helpless they feel completely powerless to change and these are features of depression powerless to change what does it matter what I do nothing's gonna make a difference nothing's gonna work for me so having this victim mindset and having this this attributional style that it sort of turns everything back on self as being, it's like the, the fault of me that I was bullied. You know, it's that sense that we are powerless, that there's nothing that we can do. So this can merge into other mindset features, which are the contributing factor to depression is a negative attributional style and a rigid cognitive mindset. So in plain terms, what that means is that you'll make these global attributions to um, something that happens. So imagine the um, depressed person with depression is waiting for a call, doesn't happen when it was meant to. They go into this global um, cause for it. Oh, no one ever does what they meant say they will and it's because of me I'm I understand why they just don't want to talk to me and it's always like this and yeah I'm just a horrible person and so rather than making up any other reason for that phone call never coming the reasoning from depression is that it's a huge ongoing always present issue often having something to do with the depressed person's worthlessness, often having to do with the dysfunction or the negativity of the world. It's like the powerlessness is, is it's almost like the world is against them. Forces move against them and there's nothing is ever going to change and it's always going to be that way and it's horrible and dreadful. And that's what I was talking about when I was talking about cognitive inflexibility the ability to think of other options, to think differently, to step outside the, the, the dark hole and look at something from a different perspective just isn't often available to people with depression. Other things that go in with the mindset of depression is the guilt. Um, I touched on that before. There's this constant it's, it ties in with the rumination the depressed person is often living largely in the past seldom in the actual present and often 
obsessed with thoughts of things that they should have done or could have done. We can hear the inner critic in this. It's become an inner demon. It's become more than just a nagging critic. It has become a really oppressive bully, that voice. You're the bad one. You shouldn't have done that. If if you were a better person, that wouldn't have happened to you, but you're not. You're shit. You're a scum. You, you're just... It's a very dark, cruel inner voice that can be present with someone with depression. And I'm demonstrating that and using those words so that we can cultivate some compassion. They are not necessarily doing this by choice, not even at all doing this by choice. Who would choose that? Right? There is stuff going on in the brain and the body that I'm going to be talking about in the next video that's going to help understand just how much of an illness depression actually is and can be. So while these are the psychological and emotional things that we can see as contributing factors, as risk factors, there's also an awful lot going on biologically that is very relevant to the picture and to the contributing causes for depression. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit the like button and subscribe. Please also join me in the next video in which we will be discussing the physiological physical, biological causes and contributing factors and risk factors involved in depression. I hope to see you there.